Well, good morning, everybody, and hello. It's strange to talk to a multitude of people when I can't actually see you, but I know you're there, and um, it's good to be with you. Just uh, remember, as we worship together this morning, that you're not alone or just with your family, but there's a whole congregation of people who are sharing with you and with every, all of us, with everybody and with God. Some writer tells us, shout for joy to the Lord or all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with uh, joyful songs. That's how you see how you can sing at home. Well, the scriptures tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive our, ourselves <coughs> and the truth is not in us. So let's come to God and confess uh, our sins. Let us all pray. Great uh, God, uh, our Father, you're the maker of heaven and earth, everything in them, and you're our maker too. You made us for fellowship with yourself. 
he made us for joyful obedience in that fellowship. And so, Father, we give you thanks and praise. But yet, Father, ever since Adam sinned, um, we've been born imperfect with a good measure of selfishness and pride and, and in particular, rebellion and refusal uh, to submit to yourself. We thank you then that you've renewed us by your Holy Spirit. You've opened our eyes to see how wonderful you are and how glorious is the salvation, how sheer gracious and, and generous and amazing that you gave your only begotten son for our salvation. We thank you that you've exalted him to your right hand for the sake of the church and for your own glory. Father, forgive us. Forgive us our, our guilt in Adam. Forgive us the the darkness uh, in our individual hearts. And Father, forgive us too, the attitudes uh, and the thoughts and the words uh, and the actions that sometimes are absolutely contrary to what you want. And sometimes, Father, do not fulfill the generosity and the Christ-likeness in a positive way that you want from us. We thank you that our Lord Jesus has lived our obedience for us and that he has suffered and died out our penalty in, in our, our place. And so, Father, we come thanking you for your forgiveness asking that you would renew us in assurance and that you'd open up our hearts and mouths to show forth your praise this morning. So, Father, we're here, we're glad to be here, and we ask that you would guide and bless us together. And, Father, what we ask for ourselves as a congregation, we ask this for all your people in all the world today. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, first of all, then, thank you for clicking in. Uh, good to have you all. Um, if we were meeting in the building this morning, we would be um, taking up an offering. If you'd like to send an offering by uh, direct debit, um, then uh, you'll find a, a note, uh, the word offerings are on the church website, that would, will show you if you click it how to make that offering by uh, bank transfer. Otherwise, if you want to make a gift uh, to the church, you could uh, ring up uh, Ian uh, and he would suggest a different way to go about it. It's uh, Palm Sunday today, and we're going to hear about that from Wayne McArdle in a, a little while. Next Friday is Good Friday, and uh, we're doing worship together. Uh, same mechanism. Go to the uh, church website, click on the button, and uh, at half past ten, uh, and you'll be into the service. After this service, after the benediction, I'm going to interview uh, Wayne McArdle with a, a few questions that members of the congregation have sent to us. And um, that's about it this morning. Uh, we move on, on now to the, the scripture reading and that's Heather.
Where you go, Heather. Yes, sorry, I was just done. The Bible reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And I'm reading from the NIV. So Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Beauty. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Hmm. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Okay. It's uh, my privilege this morning uh, to welcome uh, and introduce to you all uh, Wayne McArdle. Wayne McArdle is um, at present practicing uh, as a barrister and, and lawyer uh, over in Gippsland at uh, Druin and roundabout there. But uh, he graduated from the Presbyterian Theological College uh, last November, and um, the search committee, the Gisborne Church search committee, is minded uh, to recommend him to the presbytery to be appointed as our, our minister for the coming three years uh, at least. Wayne is a licentiate which means he's ready for ordination, but that, that hasn't happened. But um, if he's appointed here, then as soon as the session uh, requests it so, uh, the presbytery will ordain him. In the meantime, you're stuck with me, uh, chairing the, the session and um, sharing it with Wayne as we do the sacraments together. Wayne is married to Ruth, and there are six children aged between, I think, 21 and six. So he's certainly an experienced uh, family man. Uh, Wayne, welcome. Uh, we're asking you now to uh, lead us in the thanksgivings and intercessions. Bless you, Higgs. You're on. Okay, just pushing buttons here. Well, hello, welcome uh, today to our online, online service here at Gisborne uh, Presbyterian Church. Uh, if I haven't met you before, my name is Wayne McArdle, and I look forward to worshipping uh, the Lord with you today. Uh, we're going to spend some time now in prayer. So, uh, bringing our, to God our requests uh, for our church here, for our state and uh, for the world. So please, wherever you are, uh, bow with me as we pray. Uh, let's, let's talk to our God. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, uh, in such unsettled times, it's uh, good to know that you never change. Uh, it's comforting to know that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Father, you are our rock and you are our fortress. Uh, it's, it's a reassuring to know that your promises remain true, that you never leave us nor forsake us, even when the world around us seems to be slipping away. Father, we give you praise for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in him we've been brought near to you. Indeed, in his death and resurrection, you have reconciled us to yourself, making us part of your family. And so we can confidently call you Father. And Lord, so it is as your children today that we bring our concerns to you, knowing that you hear our prayers because of the Lord Jesus. 
Father, we do pray for our congregation uh, who are gathered together in faith through Jesus. And although we're not meeting in a physical sense, we are meeting, as it were, in common unity, a, a common purpose uh, to love and to worship you in the name of Jesus. And Father, please continue to bless our gathering in this way, we pray. And in doing so, please conform us to the image of your son. Father, we pray for those of us who are finding uh, this isolation time difficult. Uh, we ask, Father, that you will provide us with patience and, and strengthen our faith at this time. In particular, we think of those who are shut in because of their age or their location. Uh, please give them strength and patience as well. Father, we pray for those who are struggling financially uh, because they've lost jobs or they've been put off or their work has just dried up because of the current circumstances. Father, please provide for your people, we pray. We pr ask that you will give them their daily needs. Lord, for those who are suffering in other ways, like uh, with mental illness or depression and anxiety, we pray, Lord, that you will draw them close to yourself. and pray, Lord, that you will help them to trust you more each day. Father, there's many of us who are grieving as well. Please continue to provide comfort and the reminder of your promises that you will be with us until the end of the age. Father, likewise, we thank you for those who have returned safely from overseas, uh, for those who are recovering from illness of any kind. And we thank you for your loving and protecting hand on them. And please help us as a, a congregation to show love to each other. Help us to be generous and kind to each other. Help us to be slow to anger and quick to show mercy. Help us to become more like Jesus. Uh, Lord, so that your name might be praised. Father, we do pray for our state at this time. And our, indeed, our whole country as, as a whole, as it struggles with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we pray for our Premier Daniel Andrews and for the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. We pray, Lord, that you'll give them wisdom uh, in their roles at this time as they seek to lead our nation through these difficult times. We pray, Lord, that you help them to do so kindly and in a way that will uh, bring people together. We pray, Lord, that you'll use them to deliver what is in the best interest of our nation at this time. Father, we give you thanks that the, uh, the so-called curve in Australia seems to be flattening. And we pray, Lord, that it will continue to flatten so that our hospitals will be ready for all those who become sick. Likewise, we pray for those who work in hospitals or, or as it were, on the front line. Please protect them at this time as they seek to help others. Father, in respect to the global situation, we pray that you and your love and your mercy will bring this pandemic to an end. Father, that you would cause scientists and medical staff to find a vaccination as soon as possible. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and ask that you help many of them to recover as soon as possible. Father, in relation to those who have lost loved ones, we ask you as the God of all comfort to bring comfort as you can. Father, we do pray that this time many people will turn to you and trust in the Lord Jesus for all that he has done. And Father, we do pray uh, for these and, and, and all the other matters that are on our hearts, Lord, many which remain uh, unspoken in our hearts. And we pray these things now in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Uh, we'd now like to ask Sarah uh, to do uh, the second reading. Thanks, Wayne. The second reading is uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. That's Luke 19, 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, 
threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, hello again, and, and, and thanks, Sarah, for reading to us. Uh, let's pray now and ask for God's help uh, as we come to the word of God. So let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your love towards us. Thank you for your word, the Bible, which you've given to us to read and to understand and to apply to our lives. And please help me today to explain it in a way that is honouring to you and in a way that people can understand. And please help each one of us to apply it to our lives. We pray, Lord, that you use it to correct us, to encourage us, to instruct us, and even to rebuke us if necessary. Lord God, we cannot do this by ourselves. So we pray for your spirit to lead us and to direct us, and then to change us in these matters. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Is that on now? Uh, it's, a, it's a crazy world at the moment, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that even one month ago that we'd be doing something like this, you know, attending church by the internet, uh, everyone in their own homes, uh, worshipping God from afar and, and apart from each other, uh, everyone in their own homes watching the world go by on our screens or on our phone, uh, being self-isolated. Uh, I mean, how crazy is that? Uh, certainly, it seems a far cry, doesn't it, from the story of Palm Sunday that unfolds in our passage from Luke today. Uh, back there, pilgrims from all over Israel are descending on Jerusalem, and there are crowds of people, uh, none of them practicing social distancing, by the way, but perhaps three or four or five deep as the Lord uh, Jesus travels down the main street onto uh, into town on the way towards the temple. Uh, many have said that this particular uh, trek down into Jerusalem is, is like the coronation of Jesus as king. And, and I think uh, these people are correct. But many of us can uh, have similar sorts of uh, procession, or can remember similar sorts of processions and occasions, can't we? Uh, I remember one day uh, about 20 years ago in Hobart, when the Queen and Prince Philip were in town and the streets were so crowded, it was difficult uh, to get a position to see either of them. And there was a, a certain feeling in the air, almost electric with anticipation, especially when they arrived and, and someone called out, there's the Queen. And we all strained our necks uh, to see if we could get a glimpse of the Royal couple. Yet to be in Jerusalem on Passover day many years ago would have been something to remember. It's a day never to forget. It would have too have been sort of crazy. But friends, as we look at our passage today, I want us to consider not just the occasion of Palm Sunday, but the primary person in that procession, the Lord Jesus. And as we consider this, Jesus, I want us to be thinking about what sort of king Jesus is what sort of kingdom Jesus rules and and what this means for us some 2,000 years later so if you have your Bibles please uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 19 verse 28 and follow along as we look at this passage for I want to suggest to you today that this passage reveals that King Jesus not only is in control of his own destiny but he brings his kingdom by humility and gentleness and as such, deserves honour and praise and worship from all of creation. Now, friends, the immediate background to this passage commences 
in chapter 18, where Jesus says to his disciples, Behold, we are, we are all going up to Jerusalem, and all things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and insulted, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. And friends, this is important for us to consider because Israel had been waiting for the Messiah to come and defeat their enemies. So when Jesus arrived on the scene with miraculous powers, many people saw him as the promised Messiah, as the one who would lead them out of slavery. So when Jesus says, I'm going to be arrested and killed and then resurrected, it made no sense to them. It didn't fit their picture of a king. It didn't fit their picture of a promised Messiah. And friends, we, in hindsight, might groan at their thinking. But, but, but really, we're no different, are we? I mean, King Jesus and his kingdom are not the way we ordinarily see kings and rulers in our world, are they? We see leaders pushing their way to the top, proving their worth by their superior power and intellect and connections. So when Jesus says, my way is to die and rise from the dead, it made no sense to them. It made no sense to the disciples then. And honestly, it makes no sense to many people in our world today. Yet this is the King Jesus revealed in the Bible, isn't it? This is the King that we say as Christians that we serve. Now, friends, this passage breaks into three uh, parts really from verse 28 we learn the kind of king that jesus is uh, from verse 35 we learn how in part jesus will rule his kingdom and thirdly uh, from verses 37 on we are reminded of what this ought to mean for us today so let's let's get into it let's get into this uh, passage the first part of the story sees jesus commanding his disciples look at verse 30 it says there go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden untie it and bring it here if anyone asks you why are you untying it tell him the lord needs it now friends there's no indication in this passage whether this was pre-planned by jesus or whether it was supernaturally ordained the disciples were simply told to go and find the cult and if the cult if the owner of the cult had a problem uh, then they would have let him know that the Lord had need of it. Were the disciples surprised by this command? We don't know. But notice Jesus requests, and they go and find the cult. And when the owner challenges them, they respond, the Lord has need of it. And that seems to be enough. And off they return back to Jesus. But what's Luke trying to tell us here what's his point here friends his point here is that jesus is completely in control of the situation he knows exactly what is going on in fact every event leading up to his death and resurrection was all planned in other words luke wants us to understand that every step of his journey had been planned right down to having a cult uh, to be prepared collected at the opportune time everything will unfold exactly as god had planned it and not according to chance or the, or the whims of his enemies and friends the immediate application to us is this god is never taken by surprise he does all things according to his plans and he does all things well you know we might be surprised uh, when things don't go the way we want because we're sinful or because we don't know the future. But this is not how it is with King Jesus, our Messiah. And this is not how it will be with the, the coming arrest of Jesus, with his trial, with his death and his resurrection. Everything right down to the preparation of this cult has been planned by God. And friends, this ought to bring us comfort as well especially when things seem to us to be out of control or when everything seems so uncertain, when the house doesn't sell or when the right job does not come up or when the promotion falls through. 
or the doctor's report is not what we expect to hear or want to hear, or when the world is turned upside down because of the coronavirus, we can remember God is in control. Nothing takes God by surprise. And he is continuing to work out his great plan in history. The second application from this is that, is that we can trust that when God says something will happen, it will happen. Look at verse 32. So those who were sent found it just as he said it would be. You know, trusting in God in this sense can be counted upon as a certainty. It's not like the promise of a politician, nor of the word of a salesman. When God promises, we can take it to the bank. Well, people may let us down, and many do, we can trust that God will always come through. And Luke wants us to know that we can trust God's word, that his word is reliable. Now, friends, for us, it's not about looking for a cult. Rather, his promise to us is, is that he is faithful to forgive all our unrighteousness when we place our trust in Jesus. He promises to bring us into his family and to give us a new name. For us, it's his promise that he will never leave us, that he will bring about good for his people. Friends, in this time of uncertainty in our world, we can be encouraged in at least two ways from this passage. King Jesus is in control and his word can be trusted. We don't have to fear the unknown for we know that to God, all things are known. And we know that he always keeps his promises to us because that's the type of king that he is. And friends, the second part of this passage moves from knowing that the king is trustworthy to looking at the kind of kingdom that he will establish. Look at verse 35 to 38. Here, Jesus is seen riding on a colt. Look at verse 35 for a moment. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. Friends, Jesus is drawing a picture here for those who are watching him. He's intentionally fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which reads like this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you see what he's doing there? He's declaring publicly that he is the promised Messiah coming to bring salvation, a salvation based on his righteousness, one that is tied up with his humility, one that comes on the back of a colt, one that is consistent with his own prophecy that he would die and rise again. Now, friends, ordinarily one might expect the king to come with pomp and ceremony, riding a stallion of war at the head of a mighty army. But this is not the way that King Jesus comes. He came riding on a donkey. And I want you to notice that the people of Jerusalem immediately recognised this royal symbol, as is clear from their shouts of praise there. As verse 38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, when the people saw Jesus, they knew he was coming as their king. But sadly, what they did not understand was what kind of kingdom he was bringing. Although maybe the donkey should have given them a clue. You see, this is not a political statement Jesus was making. It was a spiritual statement. Jesus had not come to take control of the government or to overthrow the Roman through military might. No, Jesus was a new kind of king with a new kind of kingdom. One where meekness and gentleness would be the norm one which would be established by his death and resurrection, where sin would be dealt with and where love and forgiveness would be the new norms. Friends, Jesus continues to ride into our lives today with gentleness and with humbleness. And he doesn't crush us with superior might, but he says, come all who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. 
for I am gentle and lowly of heart and you will find rest in your souls. You see, friends, the kingdom of Christ is not about saving every person from oppression and sickness and problems that trouble them in this world. It's about Jesus saving his people from their sins. And this kingdom won't be established by sword or power, but by the preaching of the gospel and humility and by the work of the Holy Spirit. But friends, since we are his children, saved by grace, and we live under his rule, then the application for us is that we ought to live as people of gentleness, as people of humility in our lives. You know, every day we should be becoming more and more like Jesus. So this means there's no room for arrogance in our lives in the way that we deal with others. There should be no place in our lives for bullying others to agree with us. There should be no insisting upon uh, our rights. We shouldn't put ourselves higher than somebody else, but rather we should practice love. We should turn the other cheek. We should treat others how we want to be treated. We should practice forgiveness and mercy and generosity to all. It says, people of the kingdom, our eyes must be set on our king, who is the prime example of humility, isn't he? I mean, as the reading from Philippians reminds us, even though he was informed God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. That's our king. That's his kingdom. But finally, the passage moves on to demonstrate that Jesus, or King Jesus, deserves all honour and praise and glory. Just look at the way Luke emphasises how his disciples honour him. After the disciples brought the donkey, or brought back the donkey, they threw their cloak on it and set him on it. You know, kings didn't ride on bareback. They rode on royal sandals. In fact, the dignity of a king demanded such special honour. They didn't have a, a saddle, but they had robes. They gave all that they did. And then together as a group, they set him on the colt. Much like athletes set their coaches on their shoulders after winning his championship in a place of honour. And then notice from the passage that very soon others in the crowd spread their clothes on the, on the road. And this is an ancient way of honouring a king. In a way, it's saying that the king should not travel on ordinary roads. They deserved a royal carpet. And the crowds began to swell. And one person throws a robe on the, on the street and then another person does and, and then another person does and the closer Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the greater and nausea the crowd became. And they begin to sing and to rejoice with a loud voice. And as Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley, and then up to Jerusalem, great throngs of worshippers for the Passover were pressing towards the city gates. And the expectations were running high. Excitement was in the air. So that when somebody said, the king is coming, the news supercharged the crowd like lightning, the atmosphere becoming electric. And this was everything the disciples had been hoping for, the proof that Jesus was the Christ. And they'd seen him heal the sick, cure the blind, raise the dead. They'd heard him preach the good news of the gospel. They'd come to know him as the Messiah the Christ who had all the power of God. And now as Jesus rode into the holy city, they could see even more clearly that he was the king. And they wanted everyone to make way for this royal parade. And the shouts of praise that came to their lips were ancient songs, weren't they? Reserved for the coming king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the disciples were echoing the words of Psalm 118, verse 26, weren't they? Which said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we bless you from the house of the Lord. Yet on this day, the disciples made this song about Jesus. And rather than saying, blessed is he who comes, they said, blessed is the king who comes. Because Jesus was Christ the king. And then, friends, they lifted their praise all the way to the courts of heaven. Peace in heaven, they said, and glory in the highest. Words that echoed the very angels at Jesus' birth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all men. Because the king had come. And at his coming, people gave glory to God. Because this is the very reason that we have been made. To give glory to the most high God in the name of Jesus Christ, our king. Friends, this truly was a crazy day. And yet amid the celebration, verse 39 tells us that the Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke his disciples, to tell them to be silent. And there were reasons for their request. But Jesus' answer was very significant. Notice what he doesn't say to them. He doesn't say, you're right, the people should not really be worshipping me. But rather, on the contrary, he said that even if they stopped, that the very creation itself would ring out to fill the silence. Friends, King Jesus deserves praise and honour. He deserves worship and his praise will not and it cannot be stopped. This is something Jesus deserved when he was born. It's something that he deserved on this occasion. It's something that he deserves now and it's something that he deserves when he returns. You know, sometimes the world wants to silence the church, doesn't it? They want us to stop praising Jesus. They want us to stop exalting Jesus. He's no better than anybody else. Yet even if the world could stop us, then the very creation around us would fill the silence. And this, friends, should thrill our hearts. You know, in our crazy world at the moment, the governments have stopped many things in the name of trying to flatten the curve and saving people's lives. People are not allowed to gather in groups of more than two. Churches and sport and many other things have been shut down. You know, one of the craziest things I have seen is an AFL game of footy played at the MCG before an empty stadium. It was so eerie. Never noticed before how much the crowd played its part in the game. But you know, all around Australia today, church buildings are empty as the minister stands up to lead the people of God in worship. And friends, this too is a very eerie thing. Yet praise God, because unlike the footy which has now been suspended, the praise of King Jesus can never be suspended. It can never be cancelled. For even today, the church will send out praise to the King of Kings in thousands of homes around our nation. For this is why we've been made, to worship our King. Friends, as we draw to a close on this passage today, let us be encouraged that despite all of the uncertainties in our world today, God remains in control. His word remains trustworthy. His kingdom continues to grow each week by the preaching of his gospel and the love of his people becoming more and more like Jesus. And friends, this should encourage us even as we gather together in our private homes each week to praise his name. For friends, this is why we've been made, to worship our King. Amen. Well, let's pray and thank him for his word to us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your timely reminder this Palm Sunday 
that despite all the uncertainties in this world at this time, that you remain firmly in control of all things, having planned the beginning from the end. Thank you that nothing is a surprise to you, including this crazy world we live in at the moment. Thank you that we can trust in your word and your promises to us. And Father, we want to praise you and your son today. Please help us today to become more and more like the Lord Jesus in the way we live our lives. Help us to love each other better. And we pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, friends, uh, we're now going to join together in our last hymn together. It's a hymn that refocuses our eyes back onto the Lord Jesus, uh, a, a song that we should all be familiar with, Be Thou My Vision. Well, friends, before we come to the event, end of our formal time uh, together today, let's uh, hear these words from the letter uh, to the Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Do him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, Wayne, uh, and bless you heaps. Love the word. Um, right, everybody, um, I'm now going to uh, ask uh, Wayne a few questions that have come from the congregation so that he can introduce himself 
a little bit more. Uh, we had more questions come, and so we've made a selection of five, so that if your question is not in the collection, um, it's, I'm sorry, our time is limited. Wayne, do you have a, a picture of the family? I do, and I sent it on to uh, Steve. Think, uh, Steve or Jonathan yesterday. So why don't you, Wayne, talk about the picture? Well, there you go. It's a great photo, that one. This is a photo of when our family went down to Eagle Point, uh, grand final weekend last year. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of scarfs on there. So Luke's a supporter of the Richmond Football Club. Uh, but in that photo on the far left-hand side, you'll see my oldest daughter, her name's Hannah. Uh, she's 21. Below her is uh, Alice. Uh, and above Alice is a guy called Scott, uh, who's uh, Hannah's uh, friend. Uh, next to Alice on the left-hand side there, we have... Uh, Laura, who's a friend, if I can put it that way, of the, of the gentleman sitting below her, uh, who's Mitchell. Mitchell's my eldest boy. He's 20 years of age and a, uh, an apprentice uh, cabinet maker. Uh, next to him is Luke uh, with the Richmond football scarf, followed by Arthur, who's seven. Uh, and next to Arthur, or in, well, Arthur's in Ruth's hands. And there I am at the top with my other daughter below me was Harriet. I probably just confused you all there, but uh, there's six of us and, and Mitchell and, and, and Hannah had friends at that time. Uh, and we were just away for a week, having a time away uh, as a bit of a break. Anything else you'd like to know about the photo, John? No, that's fine. Uh it's, it's, uh, a, it's, a, it's, it's a lovely place, Eagle Point. We're down on the, the Mitchell River, as you can see that in the background there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, um, so we had a nice little spot right next to the river. So it was quite lovely. It was a yeah. nice time of refreshing. So specifically, Ruth is um, the lady in blue, Mitchell Blue uh, holding your youngest. That's correct. So That's Ruth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So on there at the end, Ruth, and then there's Arthur, who's our youngest, and Harriet, who's below me there. Yep. Beauty. When we meet them in the flesh, we'll sort them out better. And maybe when we meet them first, they'll tolerate a, a name tag. Well, oh, they, they, they may do that. They may do that. Maybe. Well. Yeah, they will, I'm sure. But we won't persecute them. Well, then, thank you. Steve, could we have uh, Wayne McArdle's face uh, back again? Okay, there he is. Hello, okay. Wayne. Hello, John, how are you? Uh, 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 we've tried to arrange these questions in a sort of sequence that takes you through who Wayne is and then his outlook, his views on this thing and that. Our first question then comes from David Todd, and it's in these words. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart? And can we see that on your face, as was the case of the onlookers who saw Stephen at his martyrdom? Mm. What a great question. Uh... Now, I've written some answers down, so I'll try not to read them. I'll just try to remember them. But um, the answer to that is, yes, I do know the Lord Jesus. I believed in God for as long as I can remember. And, uh, and I can't think of a time when I didn't know that Jesus was God's son. Um, and, there's, and I can't really think of a time when I did not know that I needed to trust in him for the forgiveness of my sins. Uh, I grew up in a semi-Christian home, and, and I was taught the truths of the gospel from a, a very young age. Uh, our family at that time went to the Church of Christ. Uh, and, and I remember when I was eight years of age that uh, I, I suppose it became more real to me or more necessary to me that I should be baptised um, um, because of the walk that I was walking with Jesus. So I asked the minister to baptise me at that time. Um, at that time, I made a, a confession or a profession before the church. 
um, declaring my loyalty and my love to Jesus. Um, and, and, and I think that's um, very important to do so. I, I, I'm convinced that for people to call themselves Christians, they need to have a personal relationship with Jesus uh, by trusting in his work on the cross and for the forgiveness of sins. Um, will you see it on my face? Well, I hope so. Uh, I, I do think it would be nonsensical that, if our, that our faces uh, would not change to reflect what God's done in our hearts. Uh, I can only hope that others will see my love for Jesus, um, not just in my face, but in the things that I do and in the way that I act and behave, um, because it's, it is true for sure that I love Jesus and I know that uh, he is my God. So hopefully that answers that question. Well, thank you, uh, Wayne. Obviously, that obviously as we go along uh, through the journey of life from childhood, God sends uh, particular people to either help us or, or hinder us sometimes. And so Sarah, Sarah Manning is uh, asking, who has been uh, one of the most impactful Christians? in your walk of faith and why? Well, I thought this was another great question. And, and as I look back over my life, there's been so many different people who have influenced me in, in different ways and made such huge impacts upon me. Uh, but the person I chose today was my mum. She, oh, I like it. I like she, it. she taught me the scriptures from an early age. She gave me a love for Jesus. Um, she's been a model for me on how to live and to be loyal to Jesus. Uh, when I was a teenager, when I was struggling with my faith uh, in my life, she prayed for me constantly and she never gave up on me. Um, so I would say um, that my mother has been very impactful upon me um, for those reasons and for many others. Well, bless you. Yeah, and bless her too. She's in, in still alive? She is, she is, she is. Yeah. She lives in Castlemaine. Right, or just... Not, or not, not, not far from Castlemaine. Yeah, right on. So then, uh, Jonathan Manning, John, Jonathan Manning um, moves on to uh, doctrine, I suppose. What was your favourite subject? while well, studying at the Theological College. And how did it improve your relationship with the Lord Jesus so far? Mm -hmm. Another good question. They're all good questions, John. Yeah, uh, they are. Well, look, I had lots of favourite subjects at PGC. And I had to think about this for a while. Uh, but one subject in particular that I liked was studying the Old Testament book of Psalms. Uh, it was when I started studying this book that I realised that God really does know the depth of the human soul. Uh, he knows our joys, he knows our pains, he knows our griefs. Uh, and in fact, it's a book that touches on every aspect of life, isn't it? Um, from great sorrows, even to isolation. I mean, just think about how David was feeling when he was running uh, away from Saul or even from his own son. He understood isolation to a certain extent then. Uh, I think that the knowledge that God understands the human soul gives me assurance that he knows me and he understands me and that when he says he would do all things for my good uh, that this includes um, all of my life um, and even uh, my own belief um, therefore I, I think it's enabled me to appreciate that God really does know me and, and I think that impacts upon the way that I can learn to trust him uh, more and more each day so I think in that sense, studying the Psalms, and, and we also studied it in Hebrew, so that was interesting by itself. Um, but I think that really impacted upon me and my relationship with God. Great. Yep. Well, yeah. It's uh, the Psalms are a great help to, I find, in prayer. Mm -hmm. I often find myself myself quoting a psalm to God. Uh, ben Spooner uh, asks, us, asks you, why does the Reformation still matter? 
you know, I thought I was back at theological college when I had this question. Uh, it's another great question. <coughs> and I have to say it would actually require much more time than I to answer it satisfactorily. But there's two things for me which makes the importance of the Reformation still relevant for us today. Uh, first, it was the Reformation which once more placed the Bible into the common person's hand. Um, this is one of its enduring legacies, without a doubt. And it's one which we as Christians ought never take for granted. Uh, having the Bible in our hands means we had the word of God available to us. Um, that's, that's really significant. The second thing is it's refocusing um, of the message of the gospel of faith on, of Jesus rather than faith and growth. Uh, without, without the Reformation, many people in the church would still be thinking that salvation is something that can be bought or, or won by their own merits. Uh, and that's why the Reformation is still relevant for us today, because salvation is by grace alone through faith. Uh, it's not by works. It's not something we can do ourselves. It's a free gift of God. Uh, you know, salvation is something that belongs to the Lord. So those, those two things, I think, in particular, I'm thinking about. There's lots of other reasons, but certainly having the word of God in their hands again and understanding justification by faith. I think those are uh, two very important things that the Reformation gave to us back when it started, but also uh, still valid for us today. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, now, uh, Dawn. Dawn McElroy. No. Yes, Dawn. Dawn asks the, the question, at Gisborne, uh, we love singing the beautiful traditional hymns of the church. Um, would you continue? Another great question. Uh, great questions, John. Uh, honestly, I can think of no good reason why we would stop singing the traditional hymns that we have in the church today. Uh, in fact, I love singing hymns and I love singing traditional hymns. But I would add that the real question in my mind is this, is, is there any good reason why these should be the only songs we sing in the church? After all, in days gone by, the church would only ever sing psalms and they would never sing hymns because they were too contemporary and, and from their point of view, not biblical. Um, but then some contemporary people um, asked, why can't we sing hymns? And in some churches, hymns are added, while in others, they were rejected. Today, however, there are those in the church who like to sing songs that reflect their own generation. And personally, I think we ought to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, as Paul says, and we ought to be loving to every generation. So in short, I suppose my answer is yes, I would very much love to continue singing traditional hymns because to stop doing so would be not to show love to every generation. Yet, I would also like to start a conversation about how we might introduce other godly songs so that we can love and care for every generation. You see, we as a church are a family and all of us have a part in this. And I hope uh, that answers the question. Um, now there speaks a, a man who, who, who loves the Psalms, loves hymns, and uh, has got six children. This is true. This is yep. true. So uh, the parents uh, and the young ones. Wayne, we want to thank you, uh, first of all, for doing church with us this morning. And we want to thank you for talking to us a little bit uh, about yourself. It's been uh, a real pleasure, uh, a real encouragement to hear the message, uh, to share in prayer with you uh, and to get to know you. Thank you. Thank and you. God bless you richly. Where you are now and in due time, we believe, when you come to us. Bless you and bless the family with you. Amen. Amen. Great. Okay, Steve, uh, I'm done. <laughs>